of colliding. It is this is the time, perhaps, when your reserves are low, your people are on holiday, uh, the factory next door is um, having a, a, a major refurbishment, and workers might leave blow torches around. In other words, you can get lots of things clustering these lights, but the, on their own, they give you no clues to the threat that might appear. Now, in terms of the crisis management team, uh, it'll, it, it'll be great if you can actually do some uh, psychometric testing and select just the right people who are going to lead or some sort of Belbin-like test. So you look at completer finishers and all these lovely people. But you don't. In most boardrooms, people are selected for, on, on their competence to make a profit uh, in one way or another or to make sure that the IT works. Now, to get these people to move from slow time to quick time to make those decisions isn't easy. It can only, by done, uh, only be done by done. It may be done by looking at things like removing the blame culture, getting people to understand that moving into a quick time environment, which carries with it the consequences of what, what you do, are far more profound than normal business as usual, and getting them familiar to do that. But I'd say the one thing that makes a good crisis team work uh, is the absence of blame culture. Yes. followed very closely by the emergence of a leader, a crisis team leader. And they only come from three areas because they got the technical competence or they got suddenly they pop up from nowhere, but people just follow them or they have some sort of rank. If you're in the military, that's quite easy to work out. But sometimes uh, people get confused. The only thing that makes a good crisis team leader are the followers. And the followers will always determine the leader. So you might say in a bit of paper, I'm a leader. But unless the followers are prepared to follow you, you're a leader in name only. There was a French general 100 years ago who famously said when his soldiers decided to do something different, he said, well, I am their leader. I suppose I better follow them. Oh. Uh, that, that's the sort of thing that can happen. Wow. Cool. Now, you, you've talked in some places about the onness. Where does that fit in? Well, there's a, a lovely chap called Patrick Lillishak, who wrote an excellent book called Preventing Chaos in a Crisis. I'm absolutely thrilled and delighted that in uh, my articles on LinkedIn, uh, he's been very good to come back to me, and we're having online discussions. Cool. I hold him in great esteem. Mm. Uh, the book he wrote, Preventing Chaos in a Crisis, I shamelessly copied that title when the British government asked me to write a guide on resilience, or on business continuity or contingency planning. That was 18 years ago. Uh, so he's alive and well. Uh, unness was quoted by Patrick in his book. And he talks about the things that are unnecessary, unbelievable. You're untrained. It's uninvited. All the uns come crashing in the door. Uh, and that's unness. And it's a very common feature of crises. Mm. Yeah, I love that. It makes a lot of sense. And sometimes people can back into an understanding through that as well as they can moving forward where they can't yet see or predict what, what might happen. Uh, hmm. I ha I ha how do you mean that? Uh, you, you want to re rephrase that? Yeah, it's more a matter that um, – it's like taking a reversal or a negative approach when something's unexpected. OK, come up with some things that might be unexpected. Um, somehow backing in in my work in creativity uh, uh, in organizations, very often they're much better. The, the staff or employees or participants are much better at, at saying what won't work and what they can't do and, and what um hasn't worked in the past and so on and then going forward what, what could work or should work or might work and so if we back in with the unness or the negative or reverse approach they back into more powerful solutions with with less resistance uh, that's interesting uh, i'm not sure it really chimes with unness uh, unness is simply a realization uh, that you perceive what's happening to be unnecessary um, uh, and in, in all its guises, um, the people sometimes do inadvertently walk backwards into the limelight of competence, uh, and they find themselves doing the right things without any, without giving any thought to it. That does happen sometimes. Mm. Uh, other things that are linked to a, a, a gross over expectation that the people in charge of your company, who are appointed because they are commercially savvy, can now suddenly become. Uh, trained soldiers or firefighters or something like, like that, because the crisis requires it. So 
people are very unforgiving uh, when those in command, in one way or another, don't necessarily act in the correct way. Because at the end of the day, you know better than I do. We're just a bunch of humans. We're not really hardwired <laughs> to work like this. Uh, unless you come to work every day uh, as a soldier trained to fight on the front line, where you can make decisions very, very quickly uh, in a rigid hierarchy that allows flexibility to an extent of decision making. Um, that's the point. Mm. So, yeah, lots of things there. But essentially, decision making in a crisis should be pushed down. Coordination should be pushed up. Uh, and that generally works well. So, Peter, you, you find yourself, obviously, like you said, you're not quite on the front lines as often as you used to be in your prior existence. But nonetheless, because you're dealing with crisis and, and um, people who themselves are having to deal with, like you just said, circumstances that they weren't necessarily trained for or prepared for, how do you keep your cool and keep your sanity and, um, you know, stay healthy? Uh, not easy. By the way, I have to tell you, my screen just said it's got five minutes left, and that's true, actually. That's all I've got. Uh, in terms of keeping yourself relatively stable in, a, in the world of unness and, and everything else, that is very, very hard to do. People actually are going to exhibit great strains of stress, stress. There must be someone in every crisis team who's got no executive power, but he or she should have the capability of tapping the leader on the shoulder and say, you've now got to step down. You're showing signs of irrational behavior. That person is worth their weight in gold. But the trouble is, it doesn't always happen. People don't plan for succession. Many crises will roll on 24 hours a day. And you suddenly realize the entirely, entire cavalry has arrived on day one, mostly because they want to help. Cynically, some are thinking, well, if I don't show up, it, it'll mean I'm not a loyal employee. So you have to work this out quickly. How long is it going to go on for? Then you tell your people who would otherwise turn up in a cavalry charge, we need you tomorrow. We need fresh, intelligent people tomorrow because today we're going to have burnout by 10 o'clock tonight. You <laughs> are going to rescue us. So how do you sell that message to the next team? It's very important. Mm. And you yourself, any tips on staying sane and healthy in this pandemic beyond the obvious ones like washing your hands and social distancing? Well, uh, in this pandemic, no, I think social distancing, but the crisis I've been involved in before where we thought we were all going to lose our lives, uh, underground fires in particular, I only mm -hmm. stayed sane because I stepped up and became a leader, not because I, it was innately in me. It was my own mechanism for staying sane. And fortunately, I, uh, on that occasion, people believed me. I can remember t saying things which I knew was not to be true, but there hearts led their head and they believed me even though they suspected it wasn't true and as a result they kept sane and we were eventually recovered um, so it's quite interesting when you look back on these events there are the same things it's a sort of french plus a change the more things change they more than mm. actually stay the same that's true that's true so peter um how do people get a hold of you if they would like to take advantage of your consulting services or have you come speak Something like that. Delighted. Um, I'm, I'm now an associate partner with a company in London called uh, Concerto Partners uh, LLP in London. Um, and if you Google that, you'll go straight on to crisis management and you'll see uh, a picture of me beaming back at you. Uh, and that would be the best rate way or privately my, my email address. I'm prepared to give it out or you might want to share it. Um, always happy to help. But going through the concerto route, because there are a few of us at senior level who think broadly the same. And, the, and working with a team of these people is a great pleasure. Uh, and that, that would certainly help. Hmm. Awesome. Wonderful. So that's Concerto Partners LLP dot, dot co, is it, instead of uh, dot co dot UK? No, I, I think if you just put that into a search engine, you'll get it. Okay. Uh, and Excellent. Put London, put London UK behind it. Yeah. Okay. Fantastic. Wonderful. Well, Peter, you know, you've always seemed to me larger than life. Um, the work you do is so impactful and has consequences, to use your terminology, for so many. And you've probably not only saved so many lives, but given peace to so many um, in organizations as well as out and about in the public that these organizations serve. So I want to thank you on um, behalf of myself, but also all the people that don't even know 
um, that you've quietly been doing this for them behind the scenes. Well, thank you, Donna. It's a pleasure to speak to you. And if my uh, Englishness has persuaded anybody that we're a bunch of sane people over here, I've obviously told an untruth. But actually, <laughs> it's absolutely a pleasure to speak to you and delighted to help. Well, thank you. And I want to thank our listeners as well for tuning into the show this week. And I'm sure you have gained some new insights, tools and strategies. So do tune in to SOBRadioNetwork.com for archived shows. And um, we look forward to having you and your friends with us next week. So do remember, as we thank Peter Power once again, the life you live is the legacy you leave. Bye bye now. <laughs>